Great Apes Survival Partnership. I'd like to welcome you to the latest edition of the GRASP webcast, The Experts Speak. Today we'll be talking about great apes, Ebola, and vaccinations, an incredibly important topic, very timely, and in many ways very controversial. Now I'd like to turn to the topic today of great apes, Ebola, and vaccinations. There are few words in the English language or in the world, frankly, that strike fear, confusion, and uh, carry the stigma uh, of Ebola. Ebola is a disease that is highly deadly, highly infectious, and has the capacity to literally alter uh, entire regions of the world, economically, politically. Uh, in so many ways, it has a devastating effect. The mortality rate among humans when Ebola is uh, is inflamed is 50 percent. But less well known is that Ebola has a devastating effect on great apes. They are very similar to human beings in terms of physiology, so it should come as no surprise that gorillas and chimpanzees can also catch Ebola and also die from Ebola. But they die from Ebola at a much higher rate than human beings. Uh, since Ebola first emerged in 1976, there have been a number of outbreaks in, in East and Central and West Africa that have impacted great ape populations. And the best estimates are that gorillas die at approximately 95%, and chimpanzees can die as high as the 70 percentile. That is incredibly uh, threatening to the long-term survival of great apes, and certainly has the ability to alter entire ecosystems. Now, Ebola is very pertinent right now because the West African outbreak that began in late 2013 and appeared to be over seems to be re-emerging. Just recently, Guinea had a flare-up of Ebola and five deaths have been reported. In fact, earlier this week, the government of Liberia announced it would close its borders with, with Guinea until the disease had been brought under control. What is clear is that Ebola doesn't rest. And what is even more terrifying is that it morphs, it evolves, and still has the capacity to kill. So with that very heavy and somewhat somber lead-in, I'd like to bring in some of our experts today who will help us talk about this issue. Uh, it's easy to think that you can protect a species or perhaps the human race from a disease, but it's not that simple. And I'd like to turn to, first of all, Ken Cameron, who is the field veterinarian for Central Africa for the Wildlife Conservation Society. Ken is joining us today from Brazzaville, Congo, and has been at the front lines of some of the recent outbreaks of Ebola. I'd like to ask you, Ken, first welcome to this webcast today, and thanks for joining us. I'd like you just to describe, if you could, what Ebola looks like and what it does to wild ape populations. Uh, th thanks for, for having me uh, uh, participate in this. I, I appreciate the, the invitation um, and the opportunity. Um, the uh, impact of the, of the Ebola virus has been, uh, by all accounts, uh, pretty devastating, at least local on local populations of great apes. Um, the most recent uh, diagnosed uh, episode was in 2005 here in Republic of Congo. Um, in, in the area uh, in and around Ojala National Park. Um, what, what was seen at, at, that, at that time was uh, large numbers of, of great ape carcasses, uh, both gorillas and chimpanzees, and loss of up to 95 percent of the known uh, gorilla groups or gorilla individuals that were being researched at the time. And that those figures specifically out of the Losi Reserve um, prior to the 2005 uh, episodic. Um, we have had a significant decrease in, in great ape populations, up to 50% throughout Ozala National Park. Uh, surveys done between 2005, 2007, and again in 2012 show uh, dramatic uh, decreases in, in great ape, uh, both gorilla and chimpanzee populations, though predominantly gorilla populations, uh, decreases of up to 50 percent throughout the national park, um, particularly in the southern half, which is extremely rich uh, uh, great ape uh, habitat. It should be supporting huge populations, and it no longer is. Um, and I think uh, most people involved in this work uh, feel that, that, though it has not been proven, um, there is 
a, a growing body of evidence to suggest that Ebola virus uh, was responsible for that. Um, it is possible that Ebola, uh, Ebola virus outbreaks, uh, Ebola virus disease outbreaks have continued, or epizootics have continued um, since that time. In 2007, for example, we saw an unusual mortality event amongst gorillas and chimps. Um, we ended up, and this was in an area just adjacent to Ozala National Park in northern Congo, where we had uh, reports of dozens of, of great apes dead. Uh, in the end, we were only able to confirm nine of those, but it, that, we believe, was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, unfortunately, uh, we were not able to get a, a, a diagnosis on that, but the the temporal and spatial aspects of it really make it uh, make us very suspicious that it was an Ebola outbreak. If I could, Ken, let me just follow up with uh, some clarification so any of the viewers out there are all starting from the same knowledge source. Is it that human beings can catch Ebola from great apes or that great apes catch Ebola from humans, one, and two, why would great apes die at such a higher rate than human beings from a disease if we're so physiologically similar? Uh, I can better address the first, uh, the, the, the first of those. Um, in in um, this region of, of the world, uh, in, in Central Africa, um, particularly in Gabon and, and Congo, uh, Republic, Republic of Congo, um, almost all Ebola virus um, uh, uh, epidemics, so uh, outbreaks of Ebola virus disease in humans, uh, were traced back to contact with uh, infected wildlife. And in most cases, that was a primate. In most cases, that was a gorilla or chimpanzee. So we know for a fact that Ebola can be transmitted from great apes to humans. Um, to the best of our knowledge, there is no well, I was going to say that there was no documented case of Ebola being transmitted from, from uh, apes, from, from humans to apes. Um, I think that is still, still believed to be true, but if, if uh, I, th I think it is something that is possible. Um, if somebody, uh, a hunter, for example, was in the forest, uh, was suffering from Ebola virus, becoming ill, showing clinical signs, and therefore shedding the virus, if he came in contact with the gorilla, uh, for example, while he was hunting and the gorilla reacted in defense and, and came in physical contact with him, there could be transmission there. In terms, um, in, in terms of, if I could... Your second question, I'm sorry. No, so it's okay. I, I was asking, frankly, uh, why great apes would die at such a higher rate uh, than human beings. Is there something physiologically different about human beings that makes them more resilient? Um, I don't think that I can really address that. Um, I, I, would be, I, I don't have, a, I really don't have an answer for that. Um, it's, it's a bit of a mystery for myself as well. Okay. Uh, and if I could just stay with you for one moment, Ken, this most recent outbreak, uh, an outbreaks that have occurred in West Africa uh, across Liberia, Guinea, and Sierra Leone predominantly, uh, while that was the cause of over 11,000 human deaths, to my knowledge, there still has been no uh, great ape that died, or chimpanzee in that region only, that has died from this outbreak. Is that still true? And if so, uh, how is that possible? Um, to date, I have not heard of any reports of wildlife involvement um, in the mortality, so no die off of wildlife associated with that that uh, re uh, recurring um, epidemic in, in West Africa. Um, I, 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 that doesn't surprise me that much. Um, if the, the predominant theory behind transmission is that uh, fruit, certain species of fruit bats a role in transmission of the virus, either as reservoirs or as vectors, so either the, the virus is circulating within uh, these bat populations and then spills over to human populations or to create populations, um, or the, um, the, the bats themselves become infected, and then when they start shedding the virus, they spread it to great apes or other wildlife or humans. Um, the West African outbreak that's, 
that's been going on for the last couple of years, uh, there was evidence to suggest that there may have been direct back to human transmission. Um, in most other places here, here in Central Africa, for example, almost every outbreak has been traced to contact with wildlife other than bats, as I said, uh, primates or, or some other species. Um, in that case, the, the, the wildlife became infected first, so an epizootic started, and then it spilled over to humans, causing a human epidemic. Um, but there can be uh, direct transmission from the reservoir host, which is most broadly believed to be bats and humans. Okay, well you certainly offer a very nice segue to one of our other guests here in terms of behavior change and human-wildlife interaction. I'd like to turn now to Gladys Kalema Zikwasoka. She is the founder of Conservation Through Public Health, which works in Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo to uh, essentially create a buffer between communities near great ape populations and national parks or protected areas and limit or reduce the ability for diseases to jump. And if I could, Gladys, how difficult is it to create that behavior change, yet how essential is it in terms of protecting great apes and, frankly, humans? Um, yeah, greetings from Uganda, Windy Forest. Um, I'm happy to be on this webcast. We carry out a lot of behavior change communication. Um, to try and prevent disease between the people, the gorillas, and the livestock. And I think in, even in DRC, there's a lot of um, people are very positive about it. The way that we've done it is that we're combining the health education and the conservation education together. And the people who we work with are called, in Uganda we call them village health and conservation teams, but in Congo they're called community conservation health workers. And basically, we talk to them about anything that can make them get diseases from people. I mean, from uh, gorillas or any other animals. And we talk to them also about the fact that if they're not healthy and hygienic, they can make the gorillas sick. So we promote hygiene and sanitation, uh, nutrition. We tell them to refer people who are sick, you know, for things like diarrhea, scabies, TB, HIV suspects. They also promote family planning and nutrition and all of that. And in the case of Ebola, we also talk to them about not eating animals found dead. It's very common for people here to eat animals that they find dead. They don't ask why did it die, they just eat it. And so we tell them that don't eat an animal found dead, an animal that you don't know where it's come from, and it's very dangerous to eat a wild animal which, which you found dead. So in that way, we also have these volunteers who monitor them and make sure that they are changing their behavior. So prior to conservation through public health, uh, getting on the ground and affecting this behavior change, how much interaction was there in, in between human beings and great apes, for instance, in Windy and some of the other areas in that region? Um, prior to setting up CTPH, conservation through public health, people, gorillas anyway, come outside the park in Windy and they come out to eat banana plants. Um, but what we ended up doing when we set up CTPH is these same volunteers alert the human gorilla conflict resolution team that these homes are being visited by gorillas and then they come out and chase them back. And then at the same time, we get the park staff who also come in and also do the same thing. They come in and they're alerted about the gorillas in community land and then they try and chase them back. But another thing that the Hugo does and the rangers is to collect samples from the gorillas when they're in community land so that we try and see if they're picking up diseases from people during that time. Uh, before that, nothing like that was happening. People and gorillas would just interact. They would come across dirty clothing. Um, they would come across people defecated in the gardens and they, were, they would pick up diseases. And scabies was one disease that occurred, but they're also picking up diarrhea diseases and other kind of diseases. But now they're aware that if you tell them not to eat a wild animal, it's not because you don't want them to get a benefit, but they realize that it could actually make them sick. Okay. Um, the title of this, of this webcast is Great Apes, Ebola, and Vaccinations. And so I'd like to now take this to that third word, in, or the fourth word, I guess, in that, in that title, vaccinations. And to turn to uh, another guest we have, Chris Whittier is a wildlife veterinarian at the Tufts University Center for Conservation uh, medicine in Boston. Thanks for joining us this morning, Chris. It's good to see you. 
you used to work in East Africa and some of the areas where Gladys Kalema's work is, and you've certainly been very closely involved and engaged in this topic for quite some time. Um, you and I have had discussions about vaccinations and, and if, if it's possible to vaccinate or protect great apes from Ebola. Give us a sense, if you could, of where that initiative currently stands and what the practical application of that might be. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, thank, I'd like to start by um, thanking you, Doug and Grass, for, for inviting me to join today and also send along my condolences about um, Moses Mpesa, who I was fortunate to work with um, years ago when he was with you. Uh, uh, to, to address the, the question of the, the sort of current um, status of the, the thinking with potential vaccination for great apes, we, there has been, you know, for the past uh, 10 to 15 years, there's been a pretty active um, development of vaccines for human use. Um, and I think as many people know, a couple of those vaccines are actually in, in various states of trials um, in, involved in the outbreak that's currently happening with, with the humans in West Africa right now. And so, and a number of those vaccines have shown some promise. So the the, the issue of um, sort of developing vaccines that can be used um, on an individual basis is already sort of pretty has been pretty well advanced. Um, and those studies are starting to reveal the efficacy and the potential side effects of some of those vaccines. So that that work has um, gone on for um, a number of years, kind of leading up to where we are right now. When, when we're talking about um, vaccinating, you know, potentially vaccinating great apes um, with the assumption that the, there, there might be a vaccine like the ones that have been used for humans, sort of an injectable vaccine that can be given on an individual basis, to some extent that, that groundwork has, a lot of that has been done. The, the next step is sort of the question of, you know, will those vaccines, first of all, will those vaccines be um, efficacious in, in gorillas and chimpanzees? And then the, the bigger question is um, the potential for them to be delivered to, to those wild populations. And so the, um, and kind of addressing the second, the second part of that, which is actually the much bigger issue, um, just sort of remind, uh, I'd like to remind kind of the audience that when we think of um, these wild grade eight populations, there's really sort of two different, um, grade eight sort of occur at two different um, states or, or statuses. One is that we've got populations um, and individuals that are what we call habituated. And those are the ones that I think most people are most familiar with that, uh, you know, researchers, veterinarians, um, and tourists go out on a daily basis and have relatively close contact with those animals. Um, for the most part, they're individually named, um, their histories are known, they can be found on a regular basis. So theoretically, um, if we had uh, uh, one of the existing human vaccines, um, that could be administered to those populations and protect, um, potentially protect those individual animals, um, assuming it was safe, assuming it was effective. Um, because the, the issue, <coughs> excuse me, the issue of delivery is pretty straightforward. We've been, um, you know, as the Mount Gorilla Veterinary Project um, and, and other um, groups have shown, you know, there there's a can be a long and successful history of direct vac um, direct veterinary work with these situated populations. In fact, that's part of what's contributed to the conservation success of mountain gorillas with the ongoing um, veterinary presence there. That, that being said, the, the bigger issue and most of what we're talking about, particularly when we think about western lowland gorillas, which are, you know, I think we would all agree are the most at-risk population when we think about Ebola, um, there's only a handful of those gorillas that are habituated. Um, you know, sort of uh, get into discussions about what that number is, but it's probably somewhere between 100, um, you know, a bit of a gray area, some that are in the process of being habituated. But, you know, the, the, so there's a the potential to directly vaccinate um, those individuals with you know, even the, potentially the existing vaccines, but by and large that's sort of going to be a drop in the bucket when we're talking about a population of potentially you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100,000 individuals, um, you know, vaccinating 100, you're not going to save that population. So the much bigger issue is kind of what um, we're, we're, we're thinking about and trying to tackle is, is there a way to do can vaccinate um, individuals that are, that are not habituated and potentially um, be able to become a part of the you know, larger population, particularly Western Lowland, but also potentially um, bonobos that are arguably <clears throat> one of the next, the next populations that has that risk as well as in the these subspecies. So, in, in terms of the, the, the practical application of this, there have been tests conducted in the last uh, five or six years in the United States, uh, certainly in New, New Iberia and other places where um, very controlled settings were used to test the efficacy of, of, of um, uh, uh, treatments. And I'm curious though, uh, is this a direct 
correlation between human treatments? Is it the same thing that was being given to people in Guinea and Sierra Leone, or is it modified for great apes? Uh, uh, so Peter Walsh who is to join us today. Um, he's been behind a little bit of that work that we did with the, the laboratory on um, My understanding, at least from the initial publication, was that the, the vaccine that they used and they originally tested in chimpanzees um, is one that has not been has not trialed and is not even um, very advanced in use in human settings. Partly because it's um, by and large not an ideal vaccine to be thinking about in any of these applications because it, it takes sort of multiple dosing. Um, and so that, that's, uh, I mean, essentially, that, that's we're pursuing a, a possibly um, different avenue um, with, at least initially, um, what's probably not an ideal vaccine for what we're thinking about um, in a larger application in wild populations. Well, the extreme conservation that takes place in East Africa that you started describing at the beginning there would seem fairly easy, uh, or a fairly easy way to administer a a vaccine to mountain gorillas, for instance, or at least those that are situated. As you indicate, western lowland gorillas and the, the western chimpanzees and so forth, much more difficult to, uh, to try and vaccinate. If you could, Chris, just how, what, what possible ways would there be to, to have any kind of an impact on populations so large that aren't habituated if what we're trying to do is make them safe against Ebola? I think that you know, sort of there are, I think probably two sort of prevailing ideas um, on, on this count right now. Um, one would be um, something similar to a to an oral vaccine or a bait um, based vaccine. And so there's been um, quite a, a quite an extensive um, body of work both in North America and in Europe um, that I'm most familiar with, perhaps also in other parts of the world, by putting an oral rabies vaccine into a bait and essentially spreading that around in the forest with the hope that target animals, you know, in our part of the world being raccoons, um, in Europe mostly being foxes that, that carry that, the, the strain of rape we're concerned with there, um, and the animals consuming that bait and becoming vaccinated by orally eating the vaccines. So that, there's the, theoretically, that could be an approach that um, might have some application um, in Central African forests. Obviously not a simple thing. We're talking about a much vaster area than anywhere that the uh, you know, the rabies world um, vaccine trials have been conducted. Um, you know, tropical environment, very humid. Lots of other animals that might think about eating eating things. Um, and so, theoretically, that that might be an approach, but it's going to take something very different than what's been done um, with the, any of the rabies approaches. And, and I think if you look at most of those cases, they are incredibly expensive with what's been done for the uh, um, the rabies vaccine approaches, mostly because. You have to spread so many vaccines in order to get the, and the, the target animals to eat of it that it becomes a very um, logistically challenging um, and very expensive approach. The other idea that's that's um, sort of currently under investigation is the idea of having essentially um, a modified uh, live uh, virus, for example, that would be modified to, to have the proteins to protect, to sort of um, confer the vaccination and protect the individuals from Ebola, but as a live virus, something that could spread naturally throughout a population. And so um, there, there is a um, group of people, and I've, I've been associated with um, some of them um, in, in partnership with WWF, they're at least exploring um, that potential avenue to see if at least that, that vaccine um, could be developed and potentially could be um, proven efficacious, at least as a, as a first step um, before thinking about ever deploying it, um, and so the you know part of part of my thinking at least on this on this case is that you know we we've been relatively fortunate for the past ten or fifteen years that we haven't experienced these large um, grade eight die-offs, um, but if they did start happening again. It would be nice to be a step ahead of where we are now and at least have some tools um, at our disposal that could potentially be used in emergencies, you know, in a, in a small basis. And I think. You know, because we're not there yet, um, you know, what I'm seeing is the, the sort of the future, this kind of immediate future is at least making sure that we have some of those tools and some of those approaches so that if the, you know, the situation arises that we need to start thinking about immediate actions, we're not, you know, 10 years back in, in, trying to, in terms of trying to develop these tools. Uh, let me turn to Gladys for a second because you, you touched on something I wanted to ask her. You're talking about an expensive vaccine and a difficult vaccine to administer. 
just to play devil's advocate with you, Gladys, how difficult would it be to explain to communities you work with every day that this vaccine is going to be given to apes at a great cost as opposed to that, that funding or those resources or that expertise being given to human beings? Would you face any kind of a uh, public relations nightmare with that or is that not an issue? Um, luckily, the communities of Windy benefit so much from gorillas and gorilla tourism and they know that in order to have tourism, gorillas need to be healthy. So it's a lot easier where people see the direct benefit of having healthy gorillas and when they know that they could also be a risk to the gorillas. So I think if you say to them that we're going to vaccinate gorillas um, to protect them so that they can be around and tourists can come and visit them and you get money from tourism, they can understand it. I think the argument is harder when there isn't tourism. And unfortunately, in uh, a lot of the places where the gorillas have died of Ebola, there's not a lot of tourism to talk about. Um, and also when they're not habituated, then it's even harder to promote them for tourism. So it's easier once they can, you can try and get some benefits for the communities that share a habitat with the gorillas. They can understand why you should spend a lot of money vaccinating the gorillas. And also in the case of West Africa, they know that the vaccine will protect them as well. That part maybe could be one argument, even if they're not benefiting from tourism. Hmm. But if they know the gorillas are vaccinated, then they they will most likely not get it, then they will understand it. But probably the biggest message is not to eat the gorillas. That would be the message from the ball. Sorry, sure. <laughs> yeah, I could just to jump in and add something. I, I, I agree completely with Gladys. This is you know, this is a very fundamental part of this whole discussion that needs to be kind of very carefully uh, managed with uh, partners, you know, the sort of humanitarian, human and medical partners on the ground to be making sure that that, that issue is addressed and sort of not not ignored. But the one piece that I would add to that, though, is that. Um, you know, part of the argument that I think um, can be made and is and is very valid kind of touches back to what Ken was speaking to earlier, which is the fact that the majority of human outbreaks stem from an initial exposure to great apes that have died from Ebola. And so theoretically, by protecting in the the great apes in the first place, you're dramatically minimizing the risk of that initial human spillover of that. Assuming that you had a comprehensive system and there was that level of protection the great ape populations, that there's a very clear and direct um, human benefit of minimizing the risk of that spillover from the great ape sources that by and large have been the majority of the cases with the human outbreaks. Okay. Let me turn to you now, Ken, and, and you've heard some of the, the, the possibilities and some of the obstacles, and I'm curious, what are the real risks that you would see in trying to vaccinate large populations of great apes in West and Central Africa? Uh, against a disease as incredibly devious and difficult as Ebola? Well, I think um, Gladys and, and Chris have both uh, touched on some, some, some of the very key points. Um, uh, you know, certainly uh, acceptance by the local population um, as well as, um, as government concerned about political ramifications of, of taking on any of these actions or making sure that the various countries are on board where uh, in certain areas for example in Bwindi National Park where it is a more of a controlled environment it's a defined region um, as, as Gladys alluded to uh, you know the great apes in, in West Africa or in, in Central Africa um, traverse uh, uh, national boundaries um, so anything that's released or put into that, that grade eight population in terms of a vaccine um, would would uh, move across move move across international boundaries, um, which just complicates the, the situation. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the the biggest concern that I have is is making sure that anything that we do release into this environment is not going to have uh, untoward untoward uh, consequences, negative consequences, either for the, the target species or for non-target species, uh, other wildlife or humans. Um, the vac some of the vaccine platforms that, are, that uh, Chris uh, touched on um, are, are based on uh, replicating, uh, attenuated replicating virus. Just to be not Ebola virus, this is not a, a um, uh, a, a 
toned down or or attenuated Ebola virus, be some other type of virus, uh, 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 you know, perhaps a, a, a cytomegalovirus, uh, something else that occurs in the species already, to which the the Ebola virus proteins would be attached. So it cannot replicate as Ebola virus. It replicates as its own virus and and one that is hopefully um, harmless to the to the grade eight population. But above all, I think we need to be careful not to uh, that that we look at the pay adequate attention before releasing anything into the environment, even on a trial basis. Make sure that we have addressed all of the the, the potential ramifications. For example. Um, Looking at not only the safety within great apes themselves, looking at the safety to to, to uh, humans should they become exposed to the, to that virus or to that uh, that vaccine, um, and looking at non-target species, um, are there effects that could be devastating to uh, uh, hoofstock, for example, uh, uh, dikers or, or buffalo, bongo, that kind of thing, um, or other primate species. Um, so above all, I would just ur urge the cautionary, the cautionary principle, um, and and I think that becomes a major challenge in trying to deal with this. Um, what we don't want to do is rush out there thinking that we're saving great apes, and and then find out that we've we've caused some other serious damage to the environment. That certainly is a, a good cautionary uh, tale or a cautionary word there. In in the past, when other major infectious diseases have, have broken out in Africa, and HIV would be a, a good example of that, one of the obstacles to treatment was the cost of, of retrovirals and any sort of vaccines. Uh, I assume, I don't know the exact cost, maybe one of our guests today does, I assume this would be an incredibly expensive undertaking. And given that conservation in all forms is incredibly underfunded, or at least not up to the task today, I wonder if any of you, uh, let's start with you, Chris, could either give a sense of the cost and or is this, is this the best way to spend conservation funds? Well, I, I guess the, first of all, my, my, my first thought would be that I'm, I'm not sure that it's necessarily, um, it's necessarily conservation funds that need to be directed towards injuries. A lot of what we're talking about is um, biomedical research in terms of trying to improve efficacy, um, safety, et cetera. And so I, so I think that, you know, I think very often we can make the argument that, uh, that one, that some people might have overlapping conservation um, implications are, are drawing from the same pool of funding, but I don't think that that's necessarily the case with a lot of what we're talking about. So that's, that's the first one I would make. The second one is I think that, the, in, in my mind, uh, with the sort of the long-term goal, I mean, I think the the individual vaccination effort, which I personally I believe should be a parallel to the larger the larger um, scheme of trying to figure out how to get population vaccinated, um, is is relatively. Important. I mean, we're talking about uh, maybe a couple hundred uh, uh, individual groups that could theoretically be targeted. I mean, we've got you know, modules, have full-time veterinary care, could be working through. Um, part of their program theoretically. Um, there's a lot of other issues there, and I would also point out, that, at least with what we know about most of vaccines right now, they, they may only last for something like a year, in which case it has to be a very um, thought out program for a population that's going to become a regular activity, and, and that, that might be what we're going to do that. But theoretically, on an the basis um, with some of these vaccines, there's not a lot of problems there um, in administering those vaccines for those habituated individuals where it might be appropriate. Uh, on the larger front, uh, the idea of a much larger population, I think that's where the discussion approaches that I outlined earlier occurred. Because I think with the data vaccine approach, depending on what kind of a vaccine it is, for the sake of argument, that it's something that's not going to be um, likely to spread to once vaccinated, and that's going to take a massive um, in terms of spreading that back kind of coverage that you really require. On the other hand, something that might be aligned in vaccine that was spread from individual to individual, in theory, as simple as vaccinating one individual and, and letting that spread, you know, obviously you, you would never use that approach on a, a sort of wider coverage and to get as many individuals vaccinated as possible, but in theory, it could just take the vaccinated that initial, initial and letting 
sort of the, the rest of their money of course without a huge extent. So I think that in theory that's where a lot of the, um, the discussion might come about the, the two sort of more obvious approaches that we're looking at right now. Uh, okay, if I if I could, we're running short on time soon, so we'll be wrapping up in a moment. If I could turn to you again, Ken, for a second. Um, not to overstate this, but in many ways this is playing God. This is intervening before perhaps uh, there is a crisis, and this is managing something very global, something very uh, much larger than, than humanity normally engages in. Um, what's just what's your sense of comfort with that in terms of, of taking such a proactive step? Well, I, I think th th there are voices out there who would who would question, you know, I, I guess as you put it, playing God. Um, should we intervene uh, just because we can? Um, it, I think it the the uh, argument for or against that uh, varies with talking about the habituated guerrillas uh, that both Gladys and, and Chris have, have already talked about, uh, already mentioned or whether we're talking about wild populations. Uh, there is an argument that if Ebola virus is a naturally occurring uh, disease, though it does have, uh, by, you know, by uh, all evidence um, today, a significant impact, massive impact on great populations, should we be doing anything about it? Um, and again, that, that's, that's a, a moral question. Uh, I, you know, I know People who will fall on, on both sides of that uh, both sides of that line. Um, there have been uh, attempts to do more broad management of, of wildlife, wildlife populations by introducing organisms, uh, either uh, uh, non-native species or um, or introducing a, a, a viral or bacterial uh, element into a population to try to control it. And in many, many cases, they have had ended up having devastating consequences. Um, so if we if we accept that that we that we want to intervene in these populations, we just need to make sure that we're doing it in a in a, a safer a, a, I mean a safer manner as possible. Well, in your opinion, Ken, are we there yet? Do we know enough? And is the confidence level high enough to be able to take that very very dramatic step? It, it depends. I think it depends on, on what, what uh, type vaccine you're, you're talking about. I think the one, the, 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 the vaccine platform that raises the most concern is that of a self disseminating, uh, you know, attenuated uh, virus. The, the one that, once introduced into the population, will continue to spread through that population. I think that is where the concern comes. And in terms of, of that particular platform, I think we have got a ways to go before we uh, uh, broadly comfortable uh, with it, with with uh, implementing that type of that type of product. Well, Gladys, in in Uganda, it's it's often said in in financial reports that every mountain gorilla brings in a million dollars a year in tourism revenue to the country, and certainly Rwanda has had tremendously high revenues as well. What would be your best guess on a government reaction to a proposal like this? If you had if you were threatened. The mountain gorillas in those countries were threatened by Ebola virus. Do you believe the government would give an okay and approve a vaccination project? Um, just as you said, Doug, because gorillas bring so much tourism to the country, tourism revenue, which goes to clean the park staff who look after them, but also go to support all the other protected areas that don't have mountain gorillas or charismatic species. The government, I think, would definitely consider it. Because for sure the money from tourism could even help to pay for that exercise. Um, I think it makes a lot of sense in Rwanda, Uganda, where tourism is really flourishing for mountain gorillas. It makes a lot of sense. I don't know about countries where there isn't much tourism, how much sense that would make. But as you said, um, conservation, um, just to put on something else you said previously, it's difficult to fundraise for conservation, the funds are limited. And there's so many needs, but tourism can pay for conservation. So, in a sense, countries that have tourism should be able to put aside some money for issues like this. I was going to say, it's an odd, odd dichotomy that you have East African countries where tourism is quite high and Ebola relatively low. Certainly, there hasn't been outbreaks in quite some time in your region.
yet yeah. in, the, in the West and Central Africa where tourism is quite low, you do have this greater issue. But let me conclude with you, Chris, if I could. Really, what next? Uh, we seem to be kind of a crossroads in terms of uh, a very big question in terms of wildlife management, in terms of resource allocation, in terms of pushing the edge of, of a scientific envelope. What is your best guess on what we'll see in the next few years? Are we going to be vaccinating great apes, or is this something still too far off? Well, I think I'll try to roll a couple of other points from that last couple of minutes. And a couple of points that I want to make is I agree with Tom on the fact that we've got to be very careful about interfering with biological systems that are naturally complex. And Ken is exactly right that there have been. Um, sort of one of the fully executed projects that things have been somewhat devastating. I think that, that has to be taken into consideration. But I would point out that part of, the, part of what we're keeping here in terms of the vaccination state, which is actually using a virus that already exists in those populations and modifying it to make protection against Ebola. So it's not, it's a bit different than in terms of totally foreign and um, a population which you don't know exactly what's going to happen. I guess I would also just call this back on this idea of kind of playing God in terms of interfering or stepping in to um, do something about the health of wildlife. And by that argument, every public health measure that we do um, in terms of vaccinating people and you know, making water clean is also playing God. I think I would sort of push back on that. Argument, but, um, that's really what we're talking about here. And so I think the, the rest of your question and question of steps. I would advocate for uh, sort of like a continual dialogue like now um, and some attention being paid towards at least trying to figure out how to develop this and do the proper um, testing and sort of limited science that's required to make sure that we're going into this, um, if the situation ever arises where we are at the point to think about starting to deploy um, any of these vaccines in all populations, which have done so, you know, with the, with the proper methodology, making sure that we're being as careful and as thorough um, and as effective as possible. So that I, I think that, that's the, sort of one of the immediate goals. But I would point out that we're, you know, we're we're vaccinating um, wild populations, including great apes, um, quite regularly in, in a lot of these landscapes with other vaccines, without much, without having the sort of same um, level of discussion. So I just you know, a lot of this is not. not quite as novel as you might think. And just to be clear too, if Ebola were to break out again among grade eight populations, at that moment it's too late to vaccinate, correct? I, I, I'm not sure that that's not necessarily the case. A couple of the, the vaccines have shown um, some efficacy sort of being administered in the face of, of some outbreaks. I think ultimately never want to be reacting to things when it might be too late. And so that's part of why I think we're still going to be having this discussion now about you know, do, doing sort of proper you know, health preventative medicine like we do with humans and wildlife all of the time by making sure that they're protected before things kind of get out of control. It's obviously much easier to, in most, most cases to prevent outbreaks of disease than it is to manage them once they happen. But I think what we're, what we're still looking at down the road in Africa is pretty good evidence of that. <clears throat> Great. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all three of our guests today. Uh, Gladys Kalem of Conservation to Public Health, uh, Ken Cameron of the Wildlife Conservation Society, and Chris Whittier from Tufts University Center for Conservation Medicine for joining us in this discussion about great apes, Ebola, and vaccines. Uh, it is an incredibly timely and fast-moving topic, and I think we'll see much more about this in the, in the days, weeks, months, and years to come. Unfortunately, Ebola seems to have an incredible staying power, and that's something we'll have to deal with regularly. But thank you very much to our guests for joining us today on, on Grass Webcast, The Experts Speak. We look forward to talking to you again next month on another relevant topic to ensure the long-term survival of great apes and their habitat in Africa and Asia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Doug. Thank you. Thanks, Doug.